Hello everyone. Welcome to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad and the Chicago and Northwestern Railway in Wyoming. Today is April 3rd, 2023. This is layout update number 41. I'm Mark Pruitt, Lander Roundhouse Mechanic. March was a month of visitors. Kevin from Harriman, Wyoming came up and joined us for our March 9th operating session. Charlie from Broken Bow, Nebraska was in the area and stopped by to see the layout. And finally, Dave and his wife Doris from Basin came down late in the month. Dave helped me make some changes to Casper Yard while Doris and my wife went shopping. Back in February, I combined some of my own funds with donations from the channel patrons and purchased a Runcam 2. Thanks, folks! This camera has an amazing depth of focus. It will allow me to make much better cab ride videos. You saw one of those in the title clip and you'll see another clip a little bit later on in the video. Now I just need to get more scenery done so that the cab ride videos will look better. But let's get on to the update, folks. Last month's update ended with a 3D printed house plopped into place near Rocky Mountain Drilling. I designed a second, slightly more elaborate house, but before I could print it, I discovered that I had damaged the LED screen in my printer when I was cleaning it. That was an expensive mistake, and it took most of the month to get a replacement screen. The screen finally arrived on March 24th, and I installed it successfully. I wasted no time putting the printer back into action, and on March 26th, I had this new house for North Casper. A few days later, the weather was warm enough that I painted both this house and the first one. Next will come door and window castings and roofs. I also printed out a large number of oil drilling pipes on racks and the floors to the loading chutes for the Powder River stock pens. Speaking of the stock pens, I continued working on them on and off for most of the month. Mid-month, I added ground cover in the form of tile grout to the stock pens area. Then I kind of took a left turn on the pens. While setting up the mostly finished sections in the area, I realized that the terrain was too uneven to do a decent job building the pens at the workbench. I would have to build them stick by stick right on the layout. That was just a bit too prototype for me. Also, the complex of pens would be extremely fragile when I was done. So I decided to build the pens on a sheet of foam board and install them into the scenery once completed. Most of that tile grout scenery I just finished will get ripped out, but I'll have a much stronger and better looking structure. With all that new bench work on the walls, I was itching to extend the track work. On March 15th, I started adding sub-roadbed west of Hudson. Over the next couple of days, I added sub-roadbed for the main line, if you can call it that, to the CNW towards Lander. That sub-roadbed sure does bow, doesn't it? Installing risers took care of the bow, except at the very far end. That bit will get cut off anyway for installation of the through truss across the Poposia what my mother always called the Popo Aggie, River. I have a really nice Central Valley Truss Bridge kit for that. On the 18th and 19th, I added a spur for the Hudson Coal Mine. This is a late addition to the track plan, as I didn't even know there were coal mines around Hudson until about a year ago. The next day, I added the West End Turnout at Hudson and began extending the track work towards Lander. A few days later, I wired and tested the turnout and new track. On the 19th, I began preparations for extending the skyboard between Hudson and Lander, attaching the 1x2 mounting strips to the walls. On the 22nd and 23rd, I cut and mounted the styrene skyboard, then did the same for the Grable skyboard, completing installation of the final piece early on the 24th. On the 26th and 27th, I patched seams in the skyboard with testers and Tamiya styrene putty, applying and sanding several layers until the seams were more or less smooth. 
On the 28th, I painted all that new skyboard. Right after I hung that last bit of skyboard the morning of March 24th, Dave and his wife arrived to spend the day. Dave had pointed out a flaw in my design of Casper Yard some months before, and today we were going to fix it. The plan as built has the switch lead extending off the runaround track. The arrival and departure track is about 14 40-foot cars long, plus loco and caboose. That meant longer trains would have to remain on the main line as they were being worked. Long reefer trains, generally 18 to 24 cars long, being switched to the icing track would take a very annoying zigzag movement then the same movements again to put the train back together. This annoying zigzag pattern became apparent during my operations test video in the Building Casper series way back in February of last year, along with the inconvenience of having the caboose track at the far end of the yard. I planned on fixing this by extending the AD track around the curve towards Douglas and adding a new caboose track off the runaround. Then Dave told me there never was a switch lead in Casper. I was floored. A switch lead is one of the most basic tenets of model railroad yard design, so naturally I included one. The fact that in the Casper yard the prototype just switched off the main was almost incomprehensible. Dave and I had several discussions about this, and then he came up with a very simple solution to the zigzag problem, Flip these two switches around so that the icing tracks are directly accessible off the main. As a bonus, the old switch lead would now become the new caboose track. On March 24th, we set out to do just that. We got to work about 10 a.m. After some fiddling around, we began removing the turnouts. I was a bit apprehensive to say the least. I could just see the yard being out of commission for several months to make this change. But Dave was confident, so we plowed on ahead. After carefully removing the turnouts, remember they were going to be reused, we cleaned up and sanded the roadbed to ensure we had smooth surfaces for the relayed track work. This would have been a lot simpler if the area wasn't already ballasted. I was surprised at how quickly and easily these first steps went. Dave cleaned the ballast off the turnouts as I cleaned up the roadbed. In very short order, we were ready to begin installation. We had a bit of both trimming the turnouts and extending the rails on one just a little bit, but it all went very well. By the time we broke for lunch, we had the first turnout reinstalled. By 2.45 in the afternoon, we had the area essentially complete with all the new track work fully installed and waited for the caulk to dry. We even moved the cabooses from their lonely spots at the far end of the yard to their new home off the runaround. There was one casualty. While Dave was soldering one of the turnouts in place, he got too close to a ground throw with the shaft of the soldering iron. It melted and wound up in the trash. Dave and Doris left for home about three that afternoon. That evening, I removed the cans from the track and tested the new arrangement with my 2102. It worked flawlessly. The next day, I installed the ground throws for the two reposition turnouts and the one that had melted. With the easier access to the icing platform and the repurposed switch lead finished, I opted to not extend the AD track towards Douglas. It will serve just fine as it is. And that old caboose track now makes a spot for a new industry in Casper. I think I might move Todd Brothers' pallet and crate to that spot. 
Dave's suggestion to rework the connection from the main line to the yard was inspired. It will enhance operations of Casper Yard immensely. What about that run camp? I was too busy to do much with it most of the month, but the titles video was shot with it, and I also put together this clip leaving Casper for Powder River. As I get more scenery done, I'll shoot more clips with it. Watch for those in the future. On March 13th, I shot and posted a video of a beat train heading from Casper to Worland. If you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, let me know in the comments. I was a bit troubled that I didn't have loads in these supposedly full beat hoppers, and in fact I got teased about that on one of the forums. I started looking around for something to model beat loads. As my wife and I were walking through Sam's Club, I grabbed a box of grape nut cereal thinking that might be a passable representation of sugar beets. I filled several cars. Turns out grape nuts are a bit too big to make convincing beets. Maybe I can sift them for smaller bits. If anyone has any ideas for modeling sugar beets, please let me know. On April 1st, I built this Code 55 turnout for the coal mine spur in Hudson. This is the first turnout that will use my 3D printed ties. Here you can see my pre-production sample placed under the rails. You can see that the three tie group to the left of the points is missing. I managed to lose them somewhere between the printer room and the train room. Hey, how about that March 9th operating session? It went very well. Basin was incorporated into the operation for the first time. I'd like to document the sessions a little better, but this time I had no extra time to shoot either videos or photos. Maybe next time. And that's it. Another productive month, and I really appreciated the folks that took time to come and visit. I hope they weren't too disappointed. April will be a busy month, with a trip to the North Platte train show the weekend of April 14th, where I'll be supporting the Casper Club's tables and selling some of my own things I've accumulated over the years that no longer fit my layout. Work will continue on the stock pins. As for other layout work, tune in to next month's update to see what happens. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next month.